Rot Ark by Michael Sisko. A tabernacle in a silent, ragged landscape of dull blues and yellows, cleft globes breathless under a smoking sky. Inside the tabernacle, in one of many vitrines adorned with the nameless, colorless pearls secreted by some nameless and colorless slime, preserved and displayed along with many other relics, is this letter, unsigned, undated, unsalutated. I believe it's now time for me to extend to you the explanation and invitation you've been, if not quite waiting for, then expecting. Forgive me if I have incorrectly assumed that you already knew the general outline of the p project, but it seemed to me that many of the beautiful signs that you've sent me strongly intimated that you did know, and it was through you, my knowing you, that the project k came to be. I first beheld the rot arc in what I thought of at the time as a d dream. Beheld is such an ostentatious word, but there really is no other word for it. The ark is not something merely seen. I beheld it, rolling on an overcast sea whose immense swells drove it nearly up into the clouds. It stood high-shouldered in the water, a wrinkled, angular tower on a tall, acute keel that impaled the water like a spear point. It looked as though it were made of stone, caked in rust veins, and something about the articulation of it, the joining of its surfaces, and its overall shaping made me think of a wasp's nest. Mariner wasps, who busy themselves assembling vast sea-going hives out of mineral wafers glued together with rust-frothing saliva. This thing had butresses to help keep it up, like a catamaran, and its lofty pinnacles were haloed by flying bodies, some looking like birds, others like insects. The whole structure was also veiled in countless diaphanous brown draperies. In the dream, my vantage point was low, nearly on the surface of the water, lo looking up. But I think these flying things must have been enormous, and from the upper portions of the structure, something flapped. I couldn't see what they were, but I thought of banners or capes stretching out of sight overhead, their ends somewhere over the horizon. My senses could only detect the flapping. It was perhaps like st standing beneath st spread sails in pitch darkness. My nose is telling me that it was the stench that was flapping. It seemed to stripe the air, occasionally flowing over me in an almost visible miasma that shaded my already straining eyes and instantly produced in me a violent contraction. The meaty piquancy of decay, I'm sure you've smelled something like it, metallic, with a disgusting, fierce insipidity, almost a taste, it didn't make sense to smell s something so distinctly in a dream. I knew at once that it was full of s something like death, a vast hive of s something like death, cruising on the sea, going to the world. There were also sounds. A hum came from the sky and the ocean, and I could hear the buzz of insect wings and the shrieks of the seabirds. The ark hissed like ice and wheezed and whined and crackled. It was a little like the vocalizations of wooden ships, but there was also a gushing of air flopping and sluicing through the interior in fetid sighs flowing over corpses. 
an infinite number of not-really-dead corpses. There were partial words inside the wind noises, articulated by the bowels of the ship, the contours of its bodies. That was the dream that clung to me during those first few weeks. After we really got to know each other, you could t tell, I'm sure, that there was something haunting me, but you were too tactful to ask. Thank you for not asking. There was so much to think about. Even to tell you a little bit would mean p pinning the idea down with the word, and even one word is enough to throw you off. It's the little differences that ruin everything, or that can save everything, the way you saved me. Back then, I couldn't shake the idea that I was smelling rot from me, from some other source I couldn't know. My thoughts were rotting. My brain trailed a garbage truck plume of tumbling foulness wherever I went, and if I sat down to think, I left a greasy black stain on the ceiling directly above my head. You remember how, at first, I always wanted to be in l loud places. I was afraid that my buzzing would be noticeable. You even teased me about the way I would give you my cheek to kiss instead of my l l lips. But at times I actually believed that a bolus of flies would flush into your mouth from mine if we kissed on the lips, each other's lips. When I started to seek out quiet places, I could tell you were confused by the change, but I couldn't explain then. What happened was, the partial w words I had heard in the wind noises in the dream began to approach me in my waking hours. I know that hearing voices is commonly supposed to be a warning sign and so on, but I at least wanted to know what they were saying before drawing any conclusions. They were very difficult to hear, even in dead silence. In fact, dead silence was as bad as a crowded restaurant. It couldn't be entirely dead. They came through best in relief against some kind of very steady but yet reedy or gappy background no noise. I could hear them in the refrigerator, for example. Actually, I didn't hear any voices, just t talking. Talk without voices, if that makes sense. Some of my organs were telling me about it. Not doing it, you understand. Liver, pancreas, kidneys, bowels. Portions of my back legs and arms were telling me warblings and soft howls. I knew they were the same words, or quasi-words, I had heard in the dream, because they had the same gently cold quality. They were l like little twists of cold breath that would slip through me like a silk scarf whisking through a magician's fingers. I seemed to be eavesdropping on a number of different but related conversations, switched at random, and although I had a strong presentiment of undertaking, I didn't. I couldn't translate a single word, but all the same there was a tone or an attitude that must have belonged to the words themselves, since I couldn't hear any voice, that I did pick up on. But... Now that I try to express that feeling, I find it very changeable. Every description I make subsides into a new one, dreamy resignation becoming hesitant expectancy, becoming commands dense with a coded uh, authority. After a while, I decided that trying to arrive at the, the sense of what I was hearing by calculation was a waste of time. So I remained alert and attended to whatever changes might happen. Soon these changes became palpable events to me, like a hitch in the breath, a nerve spasm, or an uncomfortable swerve of momentum. My listening seemed to attract the t talking. I tried out different backgrounds hoping to find one that would throw the talking into a relief high enough to make it intelligible. You remember I had a way of sticking my head out windows 
into cupboards, how I was always on the verge of trespassing. It mystified and annoyed you, and I knew it. I apologize. But I hope you understand how maddening it was. There was this non-stop gabble that seemed to clack and clitter inside me, my joints telling me, my teeth, the glands in my legs and hands, trying out different parts of me for speaking, like receiving radio waves with a tooth filling. And I couldn't help but experiment with it constantly, m mindlessly picking at the noise. At last I discovered that by placing my head just so in a gap between a large machine, perhaps an air conditioner, I didn't know what it was, and the wall of the basement I found it in, so that my left ear was turned to the corner of the r room, a particular spot a little below a point equidistant to the floor and ceiling. I could interact with the talking, there were still no plain words or voices. Putting my head in that spot warped the sound. At first the pitch would go up sharply, then, as I continued to put my head in, the sound would die almost completely away, then return as before, but with a steady expansion up and down the scale. It was a little like thrusting my head into a waterfall, first breaking its flow, then being engulfed. I would stand there, awkwardly bending forward and sideways as long as possible. So it was the listening that led to the l lung trouble, spores in the basement. I was so contented being in the hospital because the reception there was so good. I had only to turn my head on the pillow to scan out different frequencies and find the messengers who noticed me at last and visited me. Now I suspect that it was my activity re relative to them that made it hard for them to discern me. That first visit was the seizure you witnessed, when my lungs were talking. What f happened, as best I can tell, was that the sound found me. Coming from inside my lungs, it focused to a point inside my brain, and caused me to imagine the messengers visually. The m messengers had only the suggestion of a human shape, clad in the garments of sh shimmering sands that flowed like water down them, and they walked toward me through indeterminate space with a powerful solidity and graceful weightiness that was intensely beautiful. Convoluted toruses of colorless spores played around their prominences, from time to time, heavy falls of rust would drop from them to land by their feet with a sandy thump, and then curls of powdered rust would r rise up and wreath them. Roomy milk trickled down their ribs, forming pale harp strings. They had r ribbed cavities lined with bony processes. My gaze r roved wonderingly among their waddles, fans, extravagant combs, anatomical r regalia, their coral-like plumage. Their coloration was like coral, too, vivid and diverse, but the decay they heralded was colorless. I was unable to see anything other than them during the first of these episodes. I had been released from the hospital and gone into seclusion when that changed. I remember I was sitting at my kitchen table and I leaned forward and something thick dropped onto the plate from my left nostril. It was tadpole shaped and glistening, mustard colored, streaked with cream white. It didn't move, but as I gazed at it, fine white ri ribbons etched the plate inside the clear outer glaze and flexed together into a streaming, tightly compressed fold with countless nubby serrations. This resembled a germination to me, and the tadpole did spread, its edges fringed out in a way that accompanied the sensation of some new semen seeping into the little void it had left behind in my s sinuses. I could hear the clamor of speech inside me then, a little tumult, 
spinning with an implacable drive to grow, 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 coming from my bowels, my bladder, my tongue and liver, my spinal bones. In addition to the half-strangled spluttering of my own heart, I was aware of another pulsation in my body, new to me, steady, firm, and perhaps gaining in force with each stroke. In time, the messengers showed me the planet overrun, transformed into a thicket of putrescence, its oceans congealed. A colorless mist blows from the cracked and groaning ocean, brushing the land like a ashes, blanching and softening all living things. Beings like them stood in contemplative motionlessness, full in the exhalation of the rot, which was like a blast of hot, wriggling air, heavy as l lead. Suffocation was a way of breathing for them. Confinement, burial, was a way of life for them. <clears throat> when they showed me the rot arc, I panicked. I think I tried to yell, but my lungs were heavy. I had dream emphysema, and my body was weak, as if the slab were already lowered on it. When I was calm again, what I'd been told became less shrill, sharp, glaring, and I was able to l look at it. I was told the rot arc would be made by disassemblism, the last word being a sort of lexical smear in my mind, covering the idea of a s specific disassembly and of a general tendency toward disassembly, and perhaps also of a whole world of disassembly, a gornic, no, organic disassembly, while also being basically the grammatical subject of this sentence. It was hard to follow. The idea was circular. The rot arc would be made disassemblism, which would fulfill itself by bringing about that whole world of organic disassembly on which its own creation apparently depended. In any case, I knew what the initial materials of the rot arc were to be, without any confusion at all, and it was the most violent bodily re rejection of that idea which got the better of me at first. The messengers, though, went on with me, the way you might go about soothing a balky horse. They were gently persistent. What I was talking to was not a face or a mask, but more like a translation device. And in our conversation, we spoke wires of light that were like the Aurora Borealis. That was part of the way they operated, directly, without process. Gardens will be planted by the separateds, I've been told. The fruits of the garden will be had by the separateds, grenades, and the gardens will be being by the separateds, and the separateds will be being by the grenades and gardens. We are the separateds. I only kind of know what they mean by grenades, not normal grenades. There is a wind blowing from space, r red and brown. They showed me the earth plowing through space, rolling, a planet sensor, dragging behind it an incense trail of spores hundreds of thousands of miles long, a dense train of spores. They showed me the new humanity wailing in its birth pangs, inorganic and deathless bundles of twigs, laving dry concrete piers with huge frail hands like dead leaves, elongated people seen through pebbled glass, walking furred with saliences on the concave surface of an inner globe. Humans, like the shadowy blur of trees whipping by a car window, Human lamentation became a cosmic wind, hot and merciless and forever dying without death, hitting the human rot kernel like blowing on a spark for holy lepers, for holy f 
for a holy famine, unending dying, unending death rattles. My garden hums, ticks, and croons, rancid efflorescences dripping with unread letters. It's filled with placeless whispering and growing with a kind of pious intensity, their way of praying. My disciple garden's growth prayers rise like long fibers of incense and gather to form a sacred canopy. In time, I had to push my way through the garden air. The smoke hangs like huge leaves, branches studded with blossoms half melted with rot, great ewers of plant flesh brimming with glistening mucus. It is a sunless garden, for now. The beams of that furnace of decay would be too exciting for the plants. The sun is a great ri ravening of matter for itself, and its effulgence is the corruption of hydrogen. The messengers did not go into specifics, so my progress has been nothing but groping. The garden accepts my clumsy improvisations graciously. The h higher shapes aren't special shapes, you understand. Only the changed will know the shapes. I uh, always sit in my garden, listening and watching as it grows, congealing rot honey in its combs, pulling down the color skein like a lock of sky hair to, writhe, to write with. After the visit, and the time you took me to get my disability, I felt as though the inner chatter was shifting outside my body, although it stayed anchored to me. So the garden is what was once just inside me. It grew out of me. The changes happen suddenly. Rich scarlet r radiates out from one of the upper corners of the room and spreads all over the walls until it covers everything, including me, an a algae bloom, mottled gray, and turquoise lichen blooms all around me in spreading patches and distributes itself in glassy shag all over me. Lately, the blooms happen so quickly they flash over everything in the blink of an eye and recede just as fast. The garden ripples with color like a shining pool, blooming and rotting and blooming again. Now this color or pattern already browning, melting, another color thrusting up. Lately, too, my color has been different every time, so that I am suddenly a felty cobalt statue in a Halloween orange field. The raised, li livid seams between the blooms all roll over me like the crisp edges of waves. Blooms burn over me li like brush fire, and I become calm. When that happens, all my emotions become perfect, when the bloom passes, there's a moment of, there's a moment of purity. Then the old wavering and confusion slither back in through s some as yet unblocked window, somewhere in my mental basement, and I can only console myself by noting how much weaker, slower, and more hesitant each successive re return is. I've been told to, please believe me. I hated being away from you, but everything for me was everything for me then was still so much blundering in the dark. Over the plunging rot arc, the overcast breaks. There, in the puffed ring of gray clouds, the sky is bared like the gleaming skin in the center of a healing wound. What bursts from my eyes is dry, is dry. My powder hangs like incense veiling m me. The whole dome of the zodiac, the night sky, is all white windings, white blended, purling in ridges, and the stars are brown wens, wound up, dripping with decay, brown embers, sullenly building towards the collapse, the rupture, the heartless heartache, the longing with no s subject or object in the brown starshine made your absence such an agony, piercing as a siren killing me. I've been told to build the Ark. I haven't been told exactly how to, but I've been told to. I h hated being away from you, but for a long time, before the latest alteration, I was unpresentable, an entirely uh, 
unpresentable person. Now I'm fine. No one would guess, to look at me, how different I now am. The speech of my organs and body parts might be heard. That's the only care now, talking up at me. Even you won't really be able to see the difference as it now exists. I still worry that when you begin to see with your own eyes the actual nature of the change, I'm afraid you may be very distressed by it, very repelled by it, and have difficulty adjusting to me. But I must see you. I can't go on without you. I am not alone. You must realize that. Never alone. Those non-separateds attend me very conscientiously, as I'm sure they will you, if you come. They say that, while a quality of motion of a separated is punctuated, when a neophyte is no longer separated, associated movements become curling, fluid, and continuous, which is a sign of successful grafting, and, after an expected l- lapse, these, those qualities are now emerging as this neophyte recovers its motion and expresses itself to separateds, and this graft st- stutters and is set down by attending separateds as highly agitated, highly fascinated, and from an extremity this graft dispenses physical conversions, so that a l- limitless change is foreshown to those separateds as a rot arc. There is a writing coming. But first, a few scratchings, to see if the ink is flowing continuously, and a few passive doodles on the earth, trial none such as, such as myself, and a l- little lung trouble, a spree, before the great rot arc of non-separated writing puts in its appearance, and the translation gets under way, and when the writing strays close, my body mushrooms in a shadow cross so vast it engulfs the landscape and all its people, all virtually instantaneously. The movements and activities of the engulfed, oblivious to me, are as palpable as the babble of my hands and feet, my uh, appendix my bowels and lungs, the sharply chiming pricking in my glands, and my nerves actinic sighing. There's not much time before that now. I feel that. My stylistic variations are not even a prelude. The slow break will uh, alter everything, as if I'm terrified even now. It's And if I'm terrified even now, it's because I'm not certain that enough... will change. Growing away from all that, I had been but my love for you. For me, that love has not been immune, but for me, that love persists in alterations. When I venture out, I wade in, vibrating acrylic colors. I step out, jingling, with mobiles of living chimes and ornamental bones. Parks, playgrounds, streets, the children especially, the people around me become silent shapes. The colors of the shadows brighten and outshine the colors of the day. The rising sun is a rock bell whose every upstroke bleaches and replaces the world folding crosses of decay into a yeasty sky while above us calligraphic rot pennants hanging in place traverse the c- cosmos glory rots through the people around me on the street rots the light rots the sound rots the yeast rots and spangles the experience with dripping rot sequins that shout and cry rot words summoning rot nodes that polypate off me and fly away shimmering like hummingbirds through the particulated rot shells and rot waves vibrating off of me. I have a sort of colorless, fungal band shell, or a k- conch whirl that floats around me like a crinoline. It might be a satellite dish, or equivalent. Now, behind the flame-like gestures that waver against the rot light of the sun is plainly visible the majestic rot kernel in all the living separateds but banked down and brutally suppressed 
Captive knots. Ducts knotted. Cold arteries knotted, but never uprooted. Separated in, separated in wheelchairs, resting on park benches. Their sicknesses rest folded on top of them like God's gloves. Ember heat spatulated, spreading underneath the separate entrails like flames beneath the cooking pot, burning up at the smothering iron, biting it, rasping it with their rasping cat's tongues. The forms of the separated darken and become silhouettes against water dazzle and flashing leaves. Each of them is a cave with a white tangle of livid, eyeless worms suspended in the darkness, and like the impulse to tilt a picture plumb on a wall, there is the impulse to straighten the angle and unravel them free. I've been told to. The lifeless, hollow mouths half folding in on themselves, without impulse, would roll open again. So, yesterday, the separated boy, seen from a window, and from this less separated, steamed out a breath which, like a hook of incense smoke, found its way into the separated boy, who darkened, whose inner cavern opened, whose inner white knot came undone and began to convert. All that day, knowing each separated act. So this neophyte is with him when a tough cough on a chair on the stairs, the hand comes away smeared thick with brown, then bent double at the dinner table, on the floor bending head to heels, the separated flurry of acts makes a wreath, the conversion action is quick, the conversion flux from the mouth, the compilation of the rot arc, the necessary rhythm, the knuckles wrap out on the floorboards, the spray of colorless excrement, the intricacy of conversion woven moon motion lacings, and the free expression of the altered breath. I am there with him. I know it is happening as it happens without needing to see it, without needing to be present with being present. One of m my vitrines, dorned with nothing higher in itself, nothing legitimate for it itself, outside this circle miles, circle miles, colorless pearl secreted by sunless and colorless children. Especially the people around me become neophyte, recover its motion, and express itself to separateds, and this <clears throat> stutters, and is set down with huge frail listening, seemed to track the t talking, a long walking for colored with silk coral, too vivid and diverse, but the dick they her olded was colored this realization process maintaining its value by means of exchange itself with living labor increased create a surplus if the devil is indeed present the four drops joined to form the elliptical eye how you there now appears as the result of this us rebutes in it's sellish shad ped and glistening mustard colored strict with hate it didn't move but as i is dead it fine glassy all over me that i ooms happened so quickly fly through it was mere daft of stone cadence furust as there's something about the situation to it. I've been told to build the rot arc. Build the rot arc. Build the rot arc. Build the tuck arc. Cross, 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 c